Hi everybody. Well, today we're going to be starting a new series on the book of Ruth. And the book of Ruth is a, a small four chapter book that is tucked away in our Bibles between the, the larger and far more dramatic books of Judges and of 1 Samuel. And I suppose it could be easy to look at this beautiful story of Ruth and think of it as, gee, what a lovely story, which is a wonderful respite from all the drama and indeed some of the ugliness of the history of Israel that we see particularly in the book of Judges. But it would be foolish to look at the book like that or to, or to dismiss the book of Ruth so quickly. Sure enough, it doesn't have battles and it doesn't have kings involved in the story. And instead, you have very ordinary people leading ordinary lives, dealing with very human problems like death and relocating and trying to move and finding work and financial problems. And even as I'm mentioning some of those uh, very human problems, you might be saying, yeah, I can identify with that. Yep, that speaks to me. Um, but in this very human story as well, we see a profound picture of restoration. And uh, the place of this book in the canon is there to give us hope in our lives of restoration as well. And although it might not be a story of kings and battles, it does point, in fact, to the King, King Jesus, the Savior of the world. And as we read through the book and preach through this, you will see um, how that is reflected. But we're going to start by looking at chapter 1, verses 1 through to 5. And uh, particularly in these first five verses, we're going to see two of the characters of the story um, introduced, Ruth and Naomi, although I want to particularly look at Naomi today. But it starts off with these words, in the days when the judges ruled, in the days when the judges ruled. And um, if you've read the book of Judges, which precedes Ruth in the canon, uh, you might agree with me and think it has got to be one of the more depressing books in the Bible. Uh, there's chaos in Israel. And if you had to summarize what is taking place, it looks like there is a spiritual upheaval in Israel. There is a social upheaval. There is political upheaval taking place in Israel and described in that book. It's a time when the nation of Israel seems to be lurching from one crisis to another. Again, that might ring some bells for us even in our context of the world right now. And it looks like in the book of Judges, which is the, which is the truth, that um, the nation of Israel is directionless. It doesn't know where it's going or how to get to where it wants to go. And there's a phrase that you find in the book of Judges again and again. And in fact, it's one of the last lines in the book of Judges before you get to Ruth. And it's this. They say, in those days, Israel had no king. You see that again and again in Judges. No king, no one to guide them, no one to lead them. And then we get to the book of Ruth. And as I said earlier, as we read through the book of Ruth, we will see God's providential plans where he raises up and is raising up a king who will guide and lead the nation of Israel. So let's read through those first five verses and then I will make a few comments. So I'm going to be reading from the New Living Translation, um, which might be a little bit different to your own. In the days when the judges ruled in Israel, a severe famine came upon the land. So a man from Bethlehem in Judah left his home and went to live in the country of Moab, taking his wife and two sons with him. The man's name was Elimelech, and his wife was Naomi. Their two sons were Marlon and Kilion, and they were Ephrathites from Bethlehem in the land of Judah. And when they reached Moab, they settled there. Then Elimelech died, and Naomi was left with her two sons. The two sons married Moabite women. One married a woman named Orpah, and the other a woman named Ruth. But about ten years later, both Marlon and Kilion died. This left Naomi alone without her two sons or her husband. Well, you read through those first five verses and it sounds incredibly tragic. Not just an instant moment of tragedy, but after 10 years after the death of her husband, no children um, in the, the two marriages 
and the sons die. So Naomi's world, in many respects, seems to have fallen apart. But let's just go back a little bit. The starts off with a family who make a decision. They decide to leave the land of Israel and to move to the land of Moab, which is an unusual decision on one level because Moab are the traditional enemies of the nation of Israel. Probably what this tells us is just how chaotic and awful the situation was in the nation of Israel. Apart from the, the famine, which was obviously very severe, um, there is also the chaos taking place in the nation of Israel. So they, they leave Israel, they leave the promised land, and they go to live in Moab. Now often when I've heard the book of Ruth, a book of Ruth preached on and uh, read stuff about it, it's often implied that this move out of the promised land was the reason for all the tragedy that followed. It's as if all the awful events we read about in Naomi's life in these first five verses are all a result of a silly mistake that she's made, a bad decision. It's almost like God is punishing her for a bad decision. And um, although the book of Ruth never actually makes that connection between the decision that was made to move and the consequences that have fallen upon her with the death of her husband and the death of her son. And... Um, even though the book of Ruth doesn't make that connection itself, Naomi seems to reflect something of that sentiment. And we read about this in verse uh, 13. It says, The Lord's hand has turned against me. And in verse 20 to 21 it says, Don't call me Naomi, she told them. Call me Mara, because the Almighty has made my life very bitter. I went away full, but the Lord has brought me back empty. Why call me Naomi? The Lord has afflicted me. The Almighty has brought misfortune upon me. So from Naomi's perspective, she's looked at her life. She's looked at the pain and the tragedy that has overtaken her. And she has drawn the conclusion that it must be that God is angry with her. That God is judging her. And unfortunately for many Christians, they adopt the same approach. As they go through life's difficulties and trials, there is the assumption that God is in some way angry with them. But Naomi is wrong. And in fact, as you go through the book of Ruth, you realize that nothing could be further from the truth than what Naomi is stating in those verses. In fact, as you read through and as we go through this beautiful story, you understand that actually God loves Naomi. And that he is taking pity on her and he's taking the faithfulness, the obedience and the love of others, namely Ruth and Boaz. And he's taking them and he's weaving their love, their faithfulness and obedience into a story of restoration from Na for Naomi, which we will see at the end of the book. But wait, there's more. It's not only that. God loves Naomi and he's weaving a story of restoration for her. But God loves Israel, this errant child of his, as we see described in the book of Judges, that is all over the place. And what God is going to do, and we're going to see a, a, a picture of that in the, in, in the story of, of Ruth. He's going to take ordinary people like Naomi, Ruth and Boaz. He's going to take their love their faithfulness and their obedience, and he's going to weave it in to a story of restoration, which we are going to see at the end of Ruth is going to result in the birth of a boy called Obed, who's going to be the grandfather of David, who will be the king that the nation of Israel are looking for. So God is weaving restoration into the nation of Israel through the lives of ordinary people, through their pain and ordinary experiences. Nothing is wasted. He takes it all to weave a story of restoration. But wait, there's more. It's not only Naomi and the nation of Israel, but God loves the world. And he takes the ordinary lives, Naomi, Boaz and Ruth, ordinary people like you and me. He takes their faithfulness, their obedience and their love. And he weaves a story of restoration. Because when we see at the end of the book of Ruth, that that uh, boy who's born Obed is not only the, the grandfather of David,
but he is also part of the line of David, which ultimately results in the birth of Jesus, the savior of the world, the king of kings. So in the pain and the suffering and the difficulty, Naomi can't see this. And she draws these conclusions about what God must be thinking towards her and what God is like. Such a dangerous thing for us to assume and to try and understand what God is like by our circumstances. One of the strange things about this little book is that God does not actually speak in the book of Ruth. He's mentioned uh, by some of the characters, but God himself actually never speaks And yet God is working and actively involved in the lives of everyone in the story. Actually, one of the main themes theologians talk about with regards to the story of Ruth is God's providential working in the lives of people. He's not heard, and I'm sure for Naomi at times and for Ruth and and Boaz, not felt at times, but there he is actively working. He takes our faithfulness, obedience, and love even in the midst of our tears and our pain, and he weaves his restoration. Nothing is wasted. So far from being a story of judgment and how foolish decisions can really hurt us, this is a story of God's incredible grace and covenantal faithfulness to his people. How he has not left Israel in its sins. How he has not left the world broken. And how he has not left Naomi in her pain and her suffering. Now, as Christians, unfortunately, it's very easy to view our lives in a very unhelpful way. Which in some ways mirrors or has similar sentiments to what we've heard Naomi express in the beginning of the book of Ruth. The first one is we assume that the quality of our life is a reflection of of God's love for us and his presence with us. So if our life is hard, then something must be wrong. We have done something wrong. In some way, uh, something we've done or some decision we've made has upset God. And uh, as a result of that, we have lost the blessing because if God loves us, and if we are walking in the blessing, then everything should be going well. In fact, he's punishing us. The that thinking assumes that we live under a perpetual threat from God, that we live our lives like a tightrope. Just do the right thing. Do the right thing, then God blesses you and life walks out really nicely. But do the wrong thing, God angry with you, and then he's going to judge you and everything's going to go wrong. How warped an idea of what the gospel is all about. Because of Jesus Christ, we live under a perpetual promise from God that he will never leave us, that he will never forsake us, that he will finish everything that he has started. To be a Christian means to live under the perpetual promise of God, not under a perpetual threat. The second thing, a way which we can have a a, a warped view, if you like, of our lives, is we assume that the quality of our life is a reflection of of our ability to unlock the kingdom. So let me explain this to you. I have to try and have more faith or to get that prophetic picture so that I can find that thing in the heavenly courts and the heavenly realms which is blocking my blessing. If I can just find that one thing, then it will unlock everything and I can begin to live in the good life um, of perfect blessing which is my right as a Christian. The only problem with that is that there's nowhere in the Bible where we are promised a freedom from the trials of life. Jesus specifically says in this life, we will have many trials and many difficulties. And the problem with this is we live under the stress of trying to find this key, which is going to unlock this thing, remove that blockage so we can live the good life. Another way in which we can have a warped view of our our lives is we assume that somehow the devil has more ultimate control in our lives than God. And so what we do with that is we um, look for a demon behind every bush. 
and we are continually, everything that goes wrong in our lives, we're continually looking to see how the devil is getting at us, rather than considering all the goodness of God in our lives, being thankful what he is doing and trusting that even though we can't see it, he is actively working in our lives. The reality is being a Christian no way, in no way protects us from the trials of life. But we don't face those trials alone. We don't face the pain and the difficulties of life alone. And here's the remarkable thing, is that God takes our pain, our difficulties, and our struggles, and He uses them. They are never wasted. He takes them and uses them for our good. He has demonstrated His incredible, unshakable commitment to us through Jesus' death on the cross. And He has demonstrated His restoration in the resurrection of Jesus. The resurrection of Jesus, the first fruits of the ultimate restoration of all of creation. A restoration that you and I and all who have put their trust in Jesus participate in and can trust in. Our response to our life is to live with an absolute confidence in God's love for us and an absolute confidence in His promise for restoration. Even if we don't see the answers now, even if things are difficult, the call in our life for faithfulness, love, and obedience in those places is to keep our eyes on Jesus. Now, the Bible is full of narratives, these true stories about real people like Ruth and Naomi and Boaz and others. And, and uh, God places these stories in the Bible for us to learn stuff. But often what we do is we take these stories and we, we take from them life principles. Now, what we need to do is we need to live like this and do this and do that and do this. Now, undoubtedly, these stories have many things that we can take from and, and learn. But that's not the main goal of these stories. And if we go to these stories and look at all these life lessons we can learn, what we inadvertently end up doing is we end up making our faith all about what we do. But actually, the reason that God has placed these stories in the Bible is to show us what He has done. What He has done. And it's a story of grace. And when we get that right, we understand that our faith begins with God's actions towards us. And the main purpose of these narratives is to show us what God has done and to invite us to believe that He can do it again. As he took the tragedy of Naomi's life and weaved it beautifully into a story of restoration which impacted her and the whole world, maybe he can take our tragedy, our difficulties, our struggles and weave a beautiful story of restoration as well. You know, as we go through the mo at this moment, uh, I'm sure that there are a number of people who are struggling and difficulties and maybe as you're listening to this you can think of decisions you regret or worries that you have and look at your life and consider it as, as a failure even. As Naomi would have considered her life as a failure. The story invites us to believe for restoration. And uh, as we go through the story I hope that God will speak to you increasingly and that your hope will rise. May the Lord bless you and keep you, turn his face to shine upon you, and give you peace.